Chapter 23 It was midnight when Crispin took the barge ashore again, immediately below Dray Wood. The real song swung westward on its twisting journey to the Nenisbore. When the elves finally guided the barge into a narrow, heavily wooded inlet that broke south from the main channel, they found themselves at the northernmost edge of the matted breaks, miles from where they had intended to leave the river. The rains had diminished once more to a soft drizzle that hung in the chill air like fine mist. Heavy clouds obscured moon and stars, and the night was so black that elven eyes could see no further than a dozen paces. The wind had died away into a stillness, and in a deep haze it settled over the whole of the land. The elven hunters grounded the barge on a low sandbar at the head of the inlet, pulled her nearby, clear of the river, and made her fast. Moving softly and quietly, they scouted the land about them for several hundred yards in all directions, determined that nothing threatened them, then reported back to Crispin. The elf captain decided that it would be pointless to attempt further travel until morning. Will and Amberley were told to remain in their cabin, wrapped in warm blankets to ward off the cold, free for the first time in two days from the river's discomforting pitch and roll. They fell asleep at once. The elves ringed the barge and its leaping passengers, standing watch in shifts. Crispin posted himself beside the cabin entry and settled in for the night. At dawn the little company rose, packed what provisions and weapons that they could carry, then freed the barge from its mooring and let the river carry it away. It disappeared swiftly, twisting in the pull of the current. As soon as it was gone, they struck out across the matted breaks. The breaks were lowland, choked with shrub and brush, and dotted with stagnant lakes, bramble runs, and sinkholes. They split apart the vast westland forest from the banks of the Rill Song to the wall of the Roxburgh, a maze of wilderness through which travellers dared to journey. Those who did risk losing themselves hopelessly in a tangle of thicket and clustered bogs, shrouded in mist and darkness. Worse, they risked an encounter with a number of unpleasant denizens of the breaks, creatures that were vicious, cunning, and indiscriminate in their choice of prey. Not much of anything lived within these lowlands, but what did live there understood well that all creatures were either hunter or hunted, and that only the former could survive. If there were another alternative, we would not have come this way, Crispin advised Will, dropping back momentarily to share his thoughts with the Valmen. If all had gone as planned, we would have been taking horses from the outpost south along the western ridge of the breaks to the Myrmidon, then ridden west into the Roxburgh. But Dre Wood has changed all that. Now we have to be con- are concerned as much with what may follow as with what may lie ahead. The one virtue to the Vlolans is that they will hide any trace of our passing. Will shook his head doubtfully. A thing like the Reaper won't give up easily. No, it will keep hunting us, the elf agreed, but it won't catch us like that a second time. It was waiting for us at Draywood because it knew we were coming. I don't know how he knew, but it did. He glanced at the Valman, but Will said nothing. In any case, it won't know where we are now. If it expects to find us again, it will have to track us. That might have been done easily enough if we had stayed within the forest land, but we will be very difficult here. It will have to determine first where we left the river. That alone could take days then it will have to follow us into the breaks. The breaks swallow you up without a trace. The marsh hides track ten seconds after you've made them, and we've got Katzen, who was born in this country, and has crossed the breaks before. The demon, however, powerful it may be, is in strange country. We'll have to hunt by instinct alone. That gives us a very definite edge. Will Umsford did not agree. Alanon had thought that the demons would not track him when he fled Paranor, but they did. 
The Veilmen had thought that they could not find him again once Amberley and he were carried to the far shores of the Rainbow Lake by the King of the Silver River. But again they did. Why should it be any different this time? The demons were creatures of another age. Their powers were the powers of another age. Alanon had said that himself. He had said as well that one who led them was a sorcerer. Would it be so difficult for them to track a handful of elven hunters, a young girl and a Valman? Still, there was nothing to be done about it. The Valman knew if the Reaper could track them in the brakes, it would track them anywhere. Crispin had made the right decision. The elven hunters possessed considerable skill. Perhaps that would be enough to see them through safely through. The Valman was far more concerned about another unpleasant possibility. And since the encounter with the Reaper at Draywood, he had been able to think of little else. The Reaper had known that they were coming to that elven outpost. It had to have known because it had lain in wait for them. Crispin was right about that. But there was only one way it could have known. It must have been told by the spy concealed within the elven camp. The spy that Alanon had worked so carefully to deceive. If the demons knew of their plan to travel south to the elven post at Draywood, then how much more about this journey did they know? It was altogether possible the Valmen realised that they knew everything. It was a chilling possibility, one that he would have preferred not to consider further, but which he seemed more and more plausible as he weighted the facts. Alanon had been certain that there was a spy within the elven camp, Somehow the spy had managed to overhear the conversation in Eventine's study. He could not conceive of how that could have been accomplished, but he was certain that it had. Grey Wood had been mentioned. That would account for the Reaper, but the Wilderin had also been mentioned. That meant that the demons knew exactly where they were going after. Grey Wood, and if the demons knew that, then regardless of the route the little company chose to follow or the deceptions they chose to employ to elude would-be trespass uh, pursuers, chances were excellent that when the company arrived at the wilderness, there would be demons waiting for them. The thought lingered with Will Omsford all that day as the little company slogged through the marsh tangle of the brakes. Thorny brush and saw grass cut them at every passing, mist turned their clothing damp and chill, and mud and foul-smelling water seeped through their boots and filled their nostrils with its stench. They walked separate and apart from each other, speaking little, eyes peering guardedly through a rain and swelling haze as the lamp passed away about them in a changeless wash of grey. By nightfall they were exhausted, they made their camp in a sparse outcropping of brush that grew up against a low rise. There was too much risk in, in a fire, so they wrapped themselves in blankets that were damp with the lowlands chill and ate their food cold. The elven hunters finished quickly and prepared to stand watch and shift. Will just had just completed his own small meal of dried meat and fruit, washed down with a little water, when Amberley came over and huddled down beside him, her child's face peering out at him from within the folds of the blanket she had pulled up about her head. Stray locks of chestnut hair fell loosely over her eyes. How are you holding up? he inquired. I'm fine. She had the look of a lost wife. I need to talk. I'm listening. I've been thinking about something all day. He nodded wordlessly. The reaper was wavy, waiting for us at Dray Wood, she said quietly. She hesitated. You realise what that means? He said nothing. He knew what was coming next. It was as if she had read his mind. That means that it knew we were coming. She spoke the words he was thinking. How could that have happened? He shook his head. It just did. That was the wrong answer. And he knew it. Her face flushed. 
just as the demons found us at Havenstead, just as they found Elanon at Paranor, just as they seemed to find us everywhere we go. Her voice stayed low, but there was anger in it. What kind of a fool do you think I am, Will? It was the first time that she had ever used his given name, and it startled him so that for a moment he simply stared at her. There was hurt and suspicion in her eyes, and he saw that he must either tell her what Elanon had directed him to keep secret or lie to her. It was an easy decision to make. He told her about the spy. When he had finished, she shook her head reprovingly. You should have told me before now. Elanon asked me not to. He tried to explain. He thought that you already had enough to worry about. <sighs> the druid does know me as well as he doesn't know me as well as he thinks. Anyway, you, sh you should have told me. He no longer felt like arguing the point. He nodded in agreement. I know. I just didn't. They were silent for a moment. One of the elves on watch appeared, wraith-like, out of the mist, then disappeared into it again. Amberly stared after him, then glanced over at Will. Her voice floated out with the folds of her hood, her face masked in shadow. I'm not angry, really, I'm not. He smiled faintly. Good. This marsh is dismal enough as it is. I would have been angry if you had not told me the truth just now. That's why I told you. She let the matter drop. The spy over here overheard what was said in my grandfather's study that night before we left Arbalon. Then the demons know where we, where we are going, don't they? I imagine so, he replied. That means they know about Seifold as well. They know about the outcries told the Chosen because Elanon repeated it to us. They have as much chance of finding the blood fire as we do. Maybe not. Maybe not. We had the elf stones, he pointed out, wondering as he did. So if it made any difference that they did, after all, he did not really know if he could use the stones again. The thought depressed him. Who could have gotten close enough to hear what we were saying? She frowned and looked at him. She shook his head. He shook his head wordless, wordlessly. He had been wondering that too. I hope that my grandfather is all right, she murmured after a minute. I would guess that he he is better off than we are, Will sighed. At least he has some place warm to sleep. He hunched his knees up to his chest, trying to find an extra bit of warmth. Amberly moved with him, shivering with the cold. He let her settle it close against him, bundled in her covering. I wish this were finished, she whispered distantly, almost as if she was trying, saying it to herself. The Valman grimaced. I wish it had never begun. She turned her head to look at him. As long as we are wishing, I wish you would be honest with me after this. No more secrets. No more secrets, he promised. They were quiet after that. A few moments later, Amberly's he head slipped down against his shoulder, and she was asleep. The veilman did not disturb her. He left her that way and stared out into the dark, thinking of better times.